I'll call my colleague, Dr. Grodin, to come on up and give his presentation. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. I want to thank uh, my, uh, the co-directors, uh, Dr. Banerjee and uh, Dr. Berlakis for giving me the opportunity and the honor to speak at this awesome meeting. It's good to see a lot of you here back again, and uh, it's great to see that the meeting continues to grow year by year. Today I'm going to speak to you uh, about a common problem that has no clear answer yet. Hopefully we will have one. Uh, I'm going to talk about the management of antiplatelet regimen for non-cardiac surgery. Let's see. Before I begin, I want to give you some disclosures. I am a cardiologist employed by the United States Department of Veterans Affairs at the Dallas VA. And as such, I cannot be accused of making too much money. <laughs> I, however, can be accused of being a glutton for punishment for trying to practice guideline evidence-based cardiology within the VA system. And thirdly, I, my last disclosure is I only have 15 minutes, actually 12 minutes, to complete this presentation. Ten so minutes. I am, <laughs> so I am really going to talk fast. So I'm going to begin this presentation by presenting you a simple and straightforward case which actually raises a not so simple uh, and not so straightforward question. So patient X is a 72-year-old female with colon cancer, and she is soon to undergo, undergo a colon resection with a diverting colostomy. Now her past medical history is remarkable for coronary disease. She had a prior MI and a drug-eluting stent deployed in her proximal LAD uh, about six months prior to her anticipated non-cardiac surgery. Her current medical regimen of dual antiplatelet therapy is to be discontinued preoperatively before she undergoes her uh, GI surgery. So what is the central question here? What is the central problem? The central problem is that you have a patient with a coronary stent at, who, um, who is going to have dual antiplatelet therapy terminated before undergoing non-cardiac surgery. And should this patient receive IV antiplatelet therapy uh, perioperatively in order to reduce the risk of a possible uh, adverse uh, cardiac event. In other words, if Shakespeare had been a cardiologist, he might have asked the following question, to bridge or not to bridge? That is the question. So exactly how big a problem is this? What is the scope of the problem? Well, it's quite large, in fact. Annually, 3 million PCIs are performed worldwide, and between six and 700,000 are actually performed right here at home. 90% of the PCIs involve drug-eluting stents, as they should, and uh, dual antiplatelet therapy is prescribed to all of these millions of patients following deployment of their stent. And this is done in order to lower future ischemic events. Now, 50% of these patients worldwide are maintained on their dual antiplatelet therapy for more than 12 months, for more than a year. But here at home, in the United States of America, actually 51% of the patients initiated with DAP therapy are taking DAP more than two years after their stent was deployed. So what's the, what's the skinny here? What is the shakedown? Well, the shakedown is of all of these patients, these millions of patients that are stented, anywhere between 7 to 22% of them are going to require interruption of their dual antiplatelet therapy because of a need for non-cardiac surgery. Okay, so based on the prior slide, we can see that DAPT interruption, dual antiplatelet interruption for non-coronary, for non-cardiac surgery occurs frequently, and we know intuitively that it, it is certainly related to uh, adverse consequences. For example, if you interrupt DAP therapy, you will certainly develop, you have a higher risk of non-fatal myocardial infarction and stent thrombosis, a higher risk for ischemic stroke, and a higher risk from, uh, for death from CV causes. 
that on the other hand, if DAPT is continued perioperatively, then you will certainly see an increase in bleeding. Now this circle graph represents all patients who have their dual antiplatelet therapy interrupted. And what you can see is that, okay, that the largest percentage, the largest block of these patients are, are those that are being sent for non-cardiac surgery. Uh, about 16% have uh, their DAPT uh, discontinued for other clinical reasons. About 14% uh, discontinue their medications because of non-compliance. 7% actually complete the prescription of DAPT. And about 25%, we can't figure out exactly why the DAPT is uh, interrupted. So it, it, we know, we know uh, primarily for, from some very large uh, retrospective analyses that early surgery after stenting carries a higher risk of ischemic events. Now in this retrospective study by Hahn published in JAMA in 2013, they looked at almost 42,000 patients, half of which had drug-eluting stents, the other bare metal stents, and they looked at the ischemic, uh, uh, the 30-day um, uh, uh, MACE event rate, okay, in relation to the timing between stent deployment and their actual non-cardiac surgery. Now, if you will look here, sorry, if you will look at this particular hyphenated vertical yellow line, that indicates the time of surgery. And if you will look at that first category here, if non-cardiac surgery is performed less than six weeks after stent deployment, you have a 12% MACE event rate. If you can wait to between, to between six weeks and six months, that 12% MACE rate literally drops in half. And if you can get out to a year, there'll be another 25% reduction to 4.2%. But what's interesting is, even after patients are on DAPT for 12 to 24 months, there still is a 3.5% chance incidence of, uh, of a MACE event. Overall, the overall MACE event for all of these patients in the um, in Hahn study is about 5%. Now, that same retrospective analysis identified factors predictive of MACE. First of all, the timing of non-coronary surgery in relation to the stent deployment seems to be the most important, or one of the most important. The non-elective surgery is, seems to be a predictor for MACE. Prior myocardial infarction is a big one. And of course, the underlying cardiac risk index. Okay, the, 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 the uh, uh, coronary um, uh, burden. Now, what did not predict MACE, this is interesting, was the use of preoperative antiplatelet therapy, cessation of dual antiplatelet therapy, stent type, and type of surgery. Now, the, the graph on the right side of this slide shows you the adverse prognostic power of a prior myocardial infarction. And if you will look uh, at Less, if surgery, if non-coronary surgery is performed less than six weeks after stent deployment in a patient who has a prior MI, that chance, the 30-day uh, post-operative MACE event, is literally five times that of a patient who, sorry about that. Yeah, well, let me, get, let me find myself. Um, so, as I was saying, the, the presence of, of, in the past medical history, the fact that the patient had a pyomyocardial infarction significantly elevated the 30-day post-operative MACE event. Now, so if we take a look at the literature out there and we're looking for guidelines to help us answer the question about bridging, we are going to be sorely disappointed. And the reason for that, now there, there is a little bit of help out there, but it's just not that... Uh, relevant. And, and there is a study called the perioperative bridging with a 2B3A prospective study. Now, it was associated, this very limited study of only 30 patients was actually associated with clinical benefit. Now, this was a single arm IV tyrofiban bridging study involving, as I mentioned, only 30 patients. 
Now, in this very limited study, the MACE events, I think that's a typo, the MACE event was literally zero, suggesting that there may have been clinical benefit. But the downside of that is that there was a 3% incidence of, uh, of, of Timmy major bleed. Now, another study which helps us uh, comes from uh, our esteemed Dr. Banerjee and Dr. Berlakis. This was the VA perioperative bridging retrospective analysis, and it looked at patients between 2008 and 2010, 66 consecutive cases where IV tyrofiban was administered. 51 of these patients went for non-cardiac surgery, 16 went for cabbage. 65% of them were on aspirin. Dual antiplatelet therapy was uh, discontinued for eight days and IV bridging was administered for seven days using either eptifibotide or tyrofiban. All of these patients had drug-eluting stents. 86% of them went for elective uh, uh, major non-cardiac surgery. This is an interesting retrospective analysis because it shows that the incidence of death is about 4%. The incidence of, um, of uh, Stent thrombosis are the same, and gusto major bleeding the same at 4%. So this little retrospective analysis of 66 patients is actually uh, different and diametric from the tyrofiban single arm study, which I showed you prior. Now, you know, a lot of us are looking for help with this. And in Euro interventions in 2014, there was an expert multidisciplinary panel uh, uh, comprised of Italian cardiologists, surgeons, and anesthesiologists. And they looked at the thrombotic risk at patients, and they looked at the hemorrhagic risk of these patients, and then they came up with some recommendations. And I'm not going to get into the details. But what I do want to tell you is that this expert consensus panel was based on observation, anecdotal experience, and bias of the so-called experts. There was literally no randomized control study data to support these recommendations. So what I would recommend is that when we use uh, the, when we follow these recommendations, we take it with a grain of salt. Okay, so where are we now? You know, 2016, we're looking for help. Okay, to bridge or not to bridge, as Shakespeare put it. And, you know, it's a true scientific equipoise, right? A true scientific uncertainty. Millions of patients worldwide affected by DAPT interruption for non-cardiac surgery less than two years after coronary stenting, you know, is, an, is a fact. And 7 to 22 percent of these patients are going to have DAPT interruption. We know that perioperative ischemic event risk is greater in the first year. We know that most perioperative ischemic complications are driven, actually, and interestingly, by the non-stented vessel, not stent thrombosis. Ischemic risk is, uh, can be based on, uh, to a significant degree, on stent indication and complexity of the PCI. We know, as I've mentioned, that perioperative bridging has no proven benefit today, but if you do bridge, we also know that you will have an increase, about a 3% chance of a significant bleed. So here we are, scientific equipoise leads to clinical uncertainty for both providers and for patients. Okay, what does this uncertainty lead to? Well, it, here's a, a retrospective view of management styles, man, of treatment um, uh, strategies from uh, 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 various uh, clinicians. And as you can see, there's a quite a bit of variability about what to do uh, in, in terms of, uh, of bridging. So, sorry about that. So anyway, about 23% of the clinicians that were looked at here uh, just stopped aspirin only. 63%, 64% stopped their clopidogrel or prasugrel. And here, about 15% continued dual antiplatelet therapy throughout the perioperative period. All right, so what do we do? To bridge or not to bridge? I will now tell you that the answer to this question lies in Mars. That's right, lies in Mars. And at this point, I want to welcome you to the Mars trial the management of antiplatelet regimen during non-cardiac surgery trial. 
This is the brainchild of the man sitting down here to my right, Dr. Subhash Banerjee, with significant input from Dr. Emmanuel Berlakis and Dr. Rao from Duke. And I may be also uh, not mentioning others that are important. Now, this very important study will involve 60 centers in both the United States and Canada. It will involve pristine institutions and says, such as our own UT Southwestern, Duke, Stanford, University of Kansas, University of Florida, Baylor down in Houston, and Albany Medical College. It will incorporate roughly 4,000 patients into the study over a recruitment duration of five years. This is currently under active review for authorization by the NIH, and they are very seemingly very interested in this. Um, and the target enrollment would be about 64 patients per month. That basically extrapolates to about 1.03 patients per month per center. So what are the specific aims of the MARS trial? Well, it will, it will uh, construct a randomized control trial that will compare IV antiplatelet bridging versus no bridging in patients with stents who have their dual antiplatelet therapy interrupted in preparation for their non-cardiac surgery. The metrics for this study will be MACE, major adverse cardiac events, bleeding, uh, quality of life indices, and economics. Here is a brief outline of how the study will go down. Participants with coronary stents are referred for major non-cardiac surgery following PCI will be the body of these patients. They will be rent they will be randomized either to a bridging or a non-bridging arm. They will then be tracked for 30-day MACE and bleeding events. Why the MARS trial? Well, this is a highly relevant, unresolved question regarding the use of bridging that affects the lives of millions of patients worldwide with important clinical and health economic consequences. We are in a period of clear scientific uncertainty which leads to significant patient and provider uh, uncertainty and variability in management. This MARS trial will be the first pragmatic, the first pragmatic um, uh, randomized control study that will address this critical scientific gap. And hopefully it will establish practice guidelines globally and it will have a major impact on, on public health. MARS, the MARS trial, is consonant with the NIH's overarching mission to elucidate relevant translational research questions that can advance patient care. Thank you very much for your time.